So this is session D-09, preparing for post-secondary living through community-based instruction. You know we in special education love acronyms, so when you see CBI, that is community-based instruction, and that's how we'll be referring to it. So uh, at first I wanna say thank you to those of you who are joining us. I know this is the last session of the day, so we're gonna try and make it fun and interactive for you guys, but we really appreciate you guys joining us. And with that, we'd like to get to know our audience a little bit. Raise your hand if you are a special educator. Whoa, <laughs> almost everyone, cool. Raise your hand if you are a parent or a family member. Great, a student? Any students in here? Awesome. Great. So we have a little bit from every area. We love that. So we're going to go ahead and, I'm sorry? Related oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Come on. I know. Related services? <laughs> Related service providers? Okay, good. good. Are you speech or OT? Speech or OT? Adult service provider. Adult service provider. Very cool. All right. Who else? Anybody that I might have missed? No? We got everyone? IU consultant, we like that. So my name is Kim Ring, and this is my colleague Erin Punzi, and we are from the Chester County Intermediate Unit, and we're gonna be talking to you about preparing for post-secondary living through CBI uh, using the CHAMP approach. We are from the CHAMP program, and uh, we're gonna share a little bit more about ourselves, but first, ta-da, here we are. So clearly, if you haven't already seen, now that I'm, we always plan on matching our outfits, so. Uh, well, yes, those were both unplanned. This was clearly planned. So, And you wouldn't know it to look at her right now, but uh, my colleague Erin just recently had a baby. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, I apparently had just had a bagel or some sort of <laughs> something. I wasn't actually pregnant at the time. Um, as I said, I'm Kim Ring. I am the coordinator of the CHAMP program. I was formerly a teacher at CHAMP for eight years. And Erin? And <laughs> I've been the speech therapist at CHAMP for the past six years. So we've had lots of time to work together and um, really enjoy collaborating. And I'm sorry, I know I probably should just be using the microphone at the podium, but I have to be difficult because that's what I do. So um, I like to move around a lot, so feel free to just like inch me back if I step into the frame. I thought maybe because I was short it wouldn't happen, but I'm a little taller than I thought. So we are going to have some dedicated slides specific to questions, so when we get to those question slides, feel free to ask us anything and everything. We just ask that you hold your questions until we get to those slides to kind of keep things moving. So with that, we'll begin. Our first set of slides here is we're gonna address transition services and CBI. We're gonna review and discuss transition services in PA. We're going to talk about what community-based instruction actually is and some potential barriers. So again, a lot of this is probably familiar to you guys. I know we have a wide array of educators, families, students in here. Um, I won't read this to you slide by slide, but just the main takeaway here is according to Patan, when we're looking at transition services in Pennsylvania, we're talking about preparing students for adult life. It's highly individualized to each student based on their post-school goals, and we're utilizing a team approach, and of course, it's student-centered. So again, it's highly individualized, and you'll notice the common theme here as we talk about CBI. It's tailored to the student. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. But again, I'm sure all of you guys are used to hearing that because that is our motto in special education. So again, a little bit more on Patan's take on secondary transition process. So it's bridging the gap between school and adult life. Educators are responsible for facilitating the successful transition using their six-step process, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next. So the six-step process, you guys might not know that this exists formally, but you've all done it in some capacity, whether you're participating in the IEP team, driving the IEP team, when we're developing the transition services and activities within the IEP, this is what we're looking for. So number one, we're using assessment to identify our students' strengths, needs, and then goals. Uh, identifying the present levels or the baseline. Where are the students at at the present moment? What are the skill sets that we're looking at? What skills are in acquisition? Number three, transition team members, their roles, and building successful partnerships amongst the team members. Four, we're creating the plan and then establishing measurable goals to address the skill deficits and support transition. 
Finally, we're monitoring progress and we're making adjustments as needed. And that, of course, continues to be a collaborative team effort, um, a fluid approach with ongoing open communication. So what is CBI? Well, according to Patan, it's a regularly scheduled educational experiences conducted outside of the school setting, right? Pretty cut and dry. Anyone have anything that they think that we might need to add to that? Anyone? No? I know. It's been a long day. So how is CBI identified? <clears throat> According to Penn Data, the community equals the regular education classroom. And this is a question that we get a lot when we're sitting in our IEP team meetings because we identify ourselves as supplementary. And people are always kind of confused by that because we're a full-time special education placement. But as we know, according to Penn Data, Educational environment reporting is not an indication of the amount of special education services that a student with a disability receives. It simply indicates where the student receives their services. And they identify, as I said, the community as the regular ed classroom. And that's so imperative. You're going to be hearing us say that a lot today. The community is our classroom because the skills that we're teaching our students that are necessary for them to be successful in their adult life occur first in the classroom, and then they're generalized out in the community. Any questions on that? OK, great. So potential barriers to community-based instruction. There are far more probably that we can think of than I've listed here. But just a couple to touch on, limited community partnerships and connections. You know, you'll hear me say this again later on in the presentation, but we always say we're not just training our students to be successful out in the community, we're training the community to receive our students. And you know, lack of information, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, that can be a barrier in and of itself, right? Because we're looking at community partners that aren't quite sure what it is that we're doing. They're not quite sure what our students are all about. And they're a little bit nervous to invite us into their places of business, um, whether it's patrons at the movie theater, the grocery store, or whether we're having meaningful volunteer opportunities at, say, Wawa or Outback at a local office, what have you. So I, I think just being able to provide knowledge and reassurance to our community partners and helping them, helping them to develop a knowledge of what our students are all about. You know, we don't want the community to be afraid of our students. And unfortunately, that is sometimes the case. I'd like to think that it's a little bit more progressive in our area than that, and we have some great community partners, but certainly that can definitely be a barrier. Um, lack of awareness, again, and lack of acceptance. Uh, challenging behaviors. We in our population, which we'll talk about throughout the presentation, you know, our students have some challenges. Not just within the classroom, we have some behavioral challenges as well. And again, starting small, starting at a place where we can build on, not just running before we can walk. So taking smaller steps to that community-based instructional approach. Can you guys think of any others? Take just like 30 seconds, maybe chat with your neighbor and think of some other potential barriers and then we want to hear from you guys. Oh, great, you're ready. Wait, hold on, say it again. Transportation. Transportation, yes, excellent. So we are fortunate enough at the CHAMP program that we have five vans at our disposal. So we're able to transport our students. We also have a large walking community that we're able to access. But again, if that's our program through the Chester County Intermediate Unit. You know, in a school district, you're not always going to have those resources available. Yes? Funding. Funding. That is a big one. When we talk to districts and, and colleagues within other intermediate units uh, within education, that is a huge barrier. Huge, huge, huge. Yes? Staffing. Yes. Absolutely. So she said, not always being able to be one-on-one -on -one when it's necessary or when it's appropriate, that right there is a big barrier, not having the appropriate staffing necessary to help support our students out in the community. What else? Anything else? Good. Those are all great. OK. So we've given you the background knowledge. Again, a lot of that you guys probably already know. So let's just get right into it with the CHAMP program. So CHAMP stands for Communities Helping Adolescents with Autism Make Progress. We are the champions, my friends. So we're going to talk about the demographics of our program, components of student development, 
assessment, prioritizing goals, data collection, progress monitoring, and we're going to talk about some examples of specific goals and data collection tools that we use. So we have a picture up here of myself and one of our students and a quote that I really love, children with autism grow up to be adults with autism. They too need supports, acceptance, and someone who believes in them. Does anybody know who Kerry McGraw is? Anyone heard of him? He is uh, an adult. He has a, uh, an autism diagnosis. He's now uh, a well-known advocate in the field. He's a published author and a, and a speaker in the field. And I just think that this quote is just so important because you know, you hear some people talk about, you know, oh, the cute little kids with autism, the cute little kids in special education. Well, those kids grow up. And then what happens? What's next for those kids? Because there's life post school, post classroom. And it's our job to help facilitate their successful transition into adult life. So the CHAMP approach. So as we said before, community-based instruction is highly individualized and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So as such, CHAMP is an innovative community-based program where our students with autism use the community as their classroom. So we work with a highly specialized, highly trained staff. Our students are ages 14 to 21 with moderate to severe autism and we're working with them to develop the skills necessary to transition from the classroom to the community and to develop a, sex, a successful adult life. So a couple key features of our program, somebody touched a little bit on staffing and the important role that that plays in our student success, whether it's in the classroom or in the community. We're lucky enough to have a one to eight teacher student ratio and our classrooms are staffed one to one. So every student has an identified behavior mentor staff who works with them throughout the day. So those teams end up being about five behavior mentors per one student. So they rotate um, so that they're not with the same student every single day as you might see in like a classroom setting in, in more traditional schools where it's a PCA. We're actually referring to our staff as behavior mentors. So they kind of do it all. Um, our related services are integrated into the student's day. And this is kind of like new for some of the school districts that we talk to. Erin is going to talk a whole lot about that in her section, what that looks like. Um, but that's, it's really cool to kind of see how that unfolds because when you think of related services, you think about pullout, right? That tends to be the model that most school districts and, and programs are using. Our related service providers push into the student's day. So if Erin's delivering services to a student, you're going to see her doing it across environments. It's not just going to be pulled out in a speech room. We don't even have such a thing. Erin is with our students at Wegmans, helping them order from the deli counter. She's at their job sites, helping to work on those critical communication and social developmental skills that are necessary to be successful uh, in a supported employment position. Uh, again, community as a classroom. How many times have I said that now? 10, maybe? <laughs> About 100. Um, but it's true. The community is our classroom. We're starting with skills, building those foundational skills within the classroom, and then transitioning those and generalizing into the community. And everyone wants to know, well, what type of curriculum do you use? Well, we use lots of different resources to develop our curriculum, but ultimately we're looking at a functional curriculum. So it's not the traditional tabletop reading, writing, math. We're doing things that are going to be functional for our student. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But for example, what would be an example of functional math? Yes. Money. Perfect. Yes. So purchasing, budgeting. How about functional reading? Keep going. Keep it going. Signs. Safety signs. Perfect. We, we paid her to do that. So ultimately, our goal is to identify community resources that will provide functionally relevant opportunities for life skills and vocational skill instruction. So the overarching theme is the community is what? Our classroom. So student demographics. We touched on this a little bit already. Our students are ages 14 to 21, so they're transition age. And we know that Pennsylvania is, thankfully, ahead of the curve here. IDEA says transition starts at 16. Pennsylvania says, nope, it sure doesn't. It starts at 14, and sometimes earlier if the IEP team determines that that's what's appropriate. So many of our students are identified as having autism uh, more moderate to severe, so we have some of those challenging behaviors. 
Um, but certainly we have students that have diagnoses outside of the autism spectrum. Um, we also have students with either primary or secondary diagnoses of intellectual disabilities, speech and language delays, multiple disabilities. So we're not just serving individuals with autism. However, that does seem to be the primary demographic at our program at this time. So our focus is on transition planning. So we're working with families and agencies uh, to help make our students successful post-21. And when we're developing that transition plan, we know that that's what the transition plan guides the IEP. So we need to work together and make sure that it's a collaborative approach to reach those outcomes. And ultimately, we're prioritizing goals to promote success post-21. And we'll talk about how to do that, how we prioritize our goals a little bit more as we go through. So five components of student development at CHAMP. Certainly, we could list a ton more, but we're going to kind of focus on these for the point of this, uh, this presentation. So functional academics, we talked about this already. So again, CBI is not one size fits all. And everything that we talk about here, you're going to see that being the common thread across all three areas of the transition plan, post-secondary education and training, employment, and independent living. Uh, but with functional academics, we talked a little bit about this safety signs, purchasing, being able to write your name, being able to sign uh, a receipt after using a credit card or a debit card, being able to sign into work, um, things of that nature. What else? What else can we think of? What comes to mind when we think of functional academics? I'm really making you guys work, I know, for the end of the day. Anyone? No? Reading for information, being able to identify things you know, on a map when you go to a shopping center or when you're at the mall, being able to, say again? Reading instructions. Reading instructions or recipes. Exactly. And we'll see some pictures of how that looks kind of in action as we go through. Uh, community living. So we're developing those skills necessary to lead an independent life post-21, navigating the community, transportation safety. So we're not only providing opportunities for our students to be in the, com in the community, but we're bridging the gap between literally physically getting from the classroom into the community. How to be a safe passenger in a vehicle. How to navigate your walking community. And that's where safety science kind of has a little bit of a crossover there because that's an important role of community living as well. Independent living, so apartment style living. We actually have a lifestyles room in our program. And it's funny because when we give tours of the program, my favorite question is, well, why don't you look like a school? Well, we don't want to. We want to blend in with our community because that's what we're transitioning our students to do, be successful members of their community. So we do that through teaching skills like domestic tasks, cooking, self-help skills. People want to know, well, why do you have a shower here? Well, if we want our students to be successful in adult life, it's kind of an important skill, right? And certainly we know that if we're teaching generalization, instruction in areas of all of these domains don't just need to occur at home, they can occur at school too. And our program is designed to provide that type of instruction for our students. Recreation and leisure skills. We were in a presentation uh, earlier today and they talked a little bit about this and that was right up our alley because I think the misconception is, you know, well, our students know what they like. Well, sure, but you don't know what you don't know and if our students have only ever had the opportunity to be exposed to things like electronics, the iPad, watching their shows, listening to music, how do they know what else they like or don't like? You know, recreation and leisure is tough for some of our students. It's unstructured time. Uh, and we have to teach that. So that's a really important component of our program. And it's important to be successful in adult life, right? Being able to be exposed to new things, expand your repertoire of, of recreation and leisure activities. So we do that through providing group instruction within the community. We go to the bowling alley. We go to restaurants. We go to the movies. We go everywhere and anywhere that we can. We provide repeated practice at each of those locations. That's huge. You know, people think, well, don't they get tired of going bowling? No. How are we going to continue to teach them if we don't provide repeated opportunities for instruction? We have to be able to recreate those experiences and then provide our students with instruction necessary in things like how to exchange money with the cashier, how to ask for the appropriate shoe size and your bowling shoes, taking turns. There's so many things encompassed 
in something as simple as bowling, and it's important to have those repeated experiences. Our students work out at a local exercise facility, so they all have gym memberships. So that's really cool, um, because part of leading an independent life is leading a healthy life and learning how to make those healthy choices at the restaurant, um, having a workout protocol, things of that nature. Exploring the walking community. As I said, we really do blend in with our local community, and it's really nice because we have so much at our disposal, parks, walking trails, stores, things of that nature. And then number five here, this is a huge piece of our program, the pre-vocational training. So we have about 20 plus community partners that work with our program to provide our students with meaningful volunteer opportunities. And the hope is that the skills that they learn there, they'll be able to generalize into some sort of supported employment opportunity post 21. Or volunteer, whatever we decide as an IEP team is, is appropriate for that student. But the idea is that we're not limiting them. We're simply providing them as much opportunities as possible based on their skills, but also based on what else? What would be another important factor in there? Not just what they can or can't do, but what, what they're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Assessment tools. So assessment's a huge part of what we do. And you know, it gets a little tricky when you get into that transition age because as educators, many of you guys probably run into this as well, it can be difficult to find appropriate, age appropriate assessment tools for our student, right? That can definitely be a challenge. You may have heard of some of these. The Teach Transition Assessment Profile or the TTAP, how many have heard of that? A couple, good. So the TTAP is designed specifically for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. It's a skill-based assessment, and it has multiple subtests, so we can kind of assess their skills across home and school environments. And I know I just preached about our, our classroom, or the community being our classroom, but this is an assessment that we're actually able to do in-house. And even though we're doing it within the classroom setting, we're able to kind of assess those pre-vocational skills, vocational behaviors. Uh, leisure skills, interpersonal behavior. So we're looking at all of the things that would contribute to the student being successful within the community-based component of our program. But we're getting a baseline of where they are so that we can decide where we want them to go. So this is a great comprehensive screening instrument that we use, that we ourselves administer. Um, to get an idea of where our students are, this is great for new students that come to the program when we're looking to decide what would be a good fit for them where do we see them out in the community? Which of our community partners would be a good match for them? Next, we have the Brigantz Transition Skills Inventory, or the TSI. How many have heard of the Brigantz? All right, there we go. This is another great research-based, age-appropriate transition assessment. It's criterion reference, but what is really great about this is that it also comes with the self-assessment piece. So for our students who are able to provide verbal or written responses, we're able to kind of adapt that to them so we can ask them questions. Do you like to work alone? Do you like to work with others? My personal favorite, do you like to, do you like to make money? What do you think they say? Yep, they sure do. This also assesses some academic skills, post-secondary outcomes, independent living, community participation. So again, similar to the TTEP, we're looking at a variety of different components which make up um, some successful baselines for us to kind of get a gauge of where our students are in that moment. A couple others here. The FISH, the Functional Independent Skills Handbook, and this is uh, designed for individuals uh, with disabilities not specific to autism. And the idea is to be able to use this to develop goals for future educational and developmental training programs. So that's kind of the common thread here. The idea behind the FISH is that you're kind of able to go through a checklist as a respondent and mark off what level of independence are your students completing this task with? Is the skill in acquisition? Is this something we want to target for more intensive teaching? And with all of these assessment tools, the plan is not a one and done. We're able to assess these students with these tools throughout their time within our program, annually or biannually, to see how they're developing. Lastly, we have the AFOLs. Who's heard of the AFOLs, the assessment Oh, good, good. Assessment of functional living skills, another tra comprehensive transition assessment. Again, we're looking at multiple components here. Assessment, a skills tracking system. They also have a curriculum guide. So the idea is that the information that we glean from this is what's going to help guide and drive our instruction in the development of goals. So then how do we prioritize goals, right? 
you know, we are constantly thinking of our students' areas of need. And really, you could look at anybody in this room. We've all got needs. I mean, I need glasses to be able to see you. Is that a deficit? So how, then how do we prioritize? Well, we use the assessment and the data that we collect on our current goals. I, I mean, we're doing assessments all day, every day. Formal, informal, we're doing observations. It's ongoing and it's reviewed by the team. So that's what's important here because our goals are going to be driven by the assessment measures that we use and by the data that we collect. We prioritize goals that are driven by the transition plan. Once our students are of transition age, that's what guides the rest of the IEP. So it's student specific. We're looking at a variety of services and activities that we provide, experiences that we as educators provide to help make that student successful. It's student and family focused because ultimately, I think one of our other presenters today touched on this, there's a high number of students with special needs that go on post-21 to live at home with their families. So we have to make sure that our approach is collaborative, not just with the students, not just with their families, but with the outside agencies and supports that they have in place. What can we as educators do to work together and work collaboratively with our families to help address the goals that they see as most important? Addressing skills within a functional context, functional reading, functional math, we talked all about that. Ecological assessments, this one is so important because CBI looks so different for each student. It's not a one size fits all model. And every place that we go in the community requires a different set of skills. So it's our job as educators to go in there and based on our knowledge of the student, we need to decide what skills are we targeting. You could take something like purchasing or creating and managing a budget and break it down to 100 different steps. But are you targeting all of those steps for intervention or are we focusing our instruction on just a couple pieces of that task? So again, we're doing that in both the classroom and the community. And then ultimately, we want our outcomes to support independent adult life. And that's across all the domains that we've been talking about. So that brings us then to data collection and progress monitoring. So how are we keeping ourselves accountable? How are we monitoring what we're doing, the instruction that we're providing with the student to make sure that we are doing our due diligence to make these students successful. So we're using focused teaching plans and data collection tools. And that can look a lot of different ways. There's no one size fits all for this either. So we'll go over some examples in the slides coming up here. But just to talk a little bit, clear and, and concise description of what the opportunities or what the probes are going to look like. They need to be user friendly. They need to pass the stranger test. Are you going to be able to pick this up in my classroom and know exactly what skills we're targeting? We need to base it off of the supports that we're providing to the students. So identifying within the IEP, whether it's directly within the goals and objectives or under the specially designed instruction section itself, use of visuals to facilitate skill development. There's a wide variety of supports that we are to provide to our students to help make them successful in the goals that we've identified. The use of prompting, the prompting hierarchy, prompt fading to avoid dependency. Again, the overarching theme here is that we need to help make our students successful as adults. We need them to be able to achieve their highest level of independence so that they can be successful. We need to review the data as a team frequently. I feel like this is one that sometimes gets left behind. You know, the IEP team comes together once a year, we meet. We sing Kumbaya. We develop these amazing goals. We're tracking the goals. And then what are we doing? What are we doing with the goals? How are we holding ourselves accountable here? It doesn't need to be an IEP revision meeting. It can be simply program reviews, which is something that we do within our program. So at least once a quarter, we get together and we look at the data. We analyze the data as a team. And we decide, is what we're doing working? Do we need to change the plan? Because I think sometimes we get so caught up in wanting to change the outcome, we forget that you can kind of change your route. You can change what you're doing. You can change the instructional strategies that you're using. You can change the supports that you're providing. You don't have to change the goal. You can continue to have those high standards for our students. Maybe we need to look at what we're doing. And again, providing the quarterly progress reports, the reports that we provide to parents that explains the data that we collect. Right? Before I go into this, any questions so far? No? 
So here's just one example. And again, we were hesitant to even put these in here because there is no one size fits all model. It's going to depend on your student, right? It's going to depend on their goal. It's going to depend on the skills that we're targeting within the task. So this is just a simple example of what one of our data collection tools might look like, a task analysis, right? So we are taking the overarching goal of purchasing within the community and we're saying, what steps are we targeting for intensive instruction, intensive teaching? And it's going to look different for every student. It's going to look different in every location, right? Because there's nuances even within different purchasing environments. I never realized that there's a million different ways to put a card in a card reader until you really start to pay attention to those things, right? Until you do those ecological assessments. Do you swipe? Do you insert it? I always pull mine out before the chip reader's done and then I have to start all over again. So again, it's looking at those little nuances, deciding the skills that we're going to target for intensive teaching, and then how are we going to do it? How are we going to carry out the plan? What supports are we going to provide? In this case, it's anticipatory partial physical prompting. So we've included that right on in here in the data sheet to make it as user-friendly as possible. Right? So for this particular student, Mr. John Doe, it's only five steps. Could it be more than that for another student? Yeah, absolutely. Could it be less? Sure. I mean, it really, really depends on how far we're breaking this down. What skills are we looking at here? And again, that's going to change across environments. And then to accompany the data collection tool, we want an intensive teaching plan. So we know how we're collecting the data, right? Well, what's our process that we're kind of reviewing with our staff members who are going to be out with the students throughout the day? We need to explicitly teach our staff how we're doing it. We need to take a uniformed approach, right? Have we heard of fidelity checks? Yeah, making sure that we're all doing it the exact same way, right? Because if we want to get our students to the highest level of independence, we have to make sure that we're all doing it the exact same way, right? So oftentimes what we'll do as a school entity is we'll provide these to parents. We'll provide these to supports coordinators. They want to know, well, how do you get them to do that? Because they won't do it for me. Well, how are you doing it? Do you have a systematic approach to how you're teaching this? Because this is what's successful for us, and we'd love to share it with you, right? We want our students to be able to generalize the skills. So if we're taking our students to purchase a snack at Wawa, and they happen to go there every Saturday morning with their family, shouldn't they be doing it the same way? Right? Yeah. Another example here, brushing teeth. This is one that just, you know, I never really realized how many steps went into brushing teeth until you go to make a data sheet. I mean, we're talking it could be upwards of 50 steps, and that's crazy. So for this student in particular, um, we're just looking at seven. But that's not to say that it can't be 50. You have to work with your IEP team. You have to decide what that student's goal is. You have to decide what skills we're targeting for intensive teaching. And again, a very explicit, detailed, teaching program to accompany, I'm sorry, teaching plan to accompany the data collection tool. I think I said this quote earlier, but it really is one of my favorites. Ultimately, we're not just preparing our students to go into the community and live successful lives outside of their school program. We're preparing the community to receive our students. This is one of my favorite pictures of one of our students. Could she be any prouder? So she put all of those pies together. I know it's kind of hard to see. It's like a key lime pie, but she actually assembled all of those herself. Um, but that's not where we started. I mentioned earlier about making sure that we're walking before we're running, making sure that our approach to CBI is systematic, right? So we're starting with small, attainable goals, and then we're building from there. I just love that picture. <laughs> Any questions so far? No? All right, then I'm going to turn it over to Erin to talk about delivering related services in the community. You can hold oh, on to I that. I'll use this one. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I'm a speech pathologist. I'm going to try to talk about related services as a whole, but it's obviously going to have a, a heavy um, lean towards speech therapy, but I'll try to make it as generalized as I can. Um, there's certainly a lot of benefits, but also challenges to delivering related services in a community setting. 
So we'll talk about what those are. We'll talk about how to target goals and collect data when you're in a community-based setting. That's certainly one of the biggest challenges. Um, and Kim already touched on this, but analyzing the data and kind of figuring out what that means, whether that means you have to make changes or whether that means you move on. Um, when I first came to the CHAMP program, I came from a regular ed school. So coming to a community-based program was such a huge change for me, and it was a huge change in my thinking because before it was a pull-out session, so I would take them out into a, a speech room, and I would have my speech flashcards and my worksheets, and um, you know they left and forgot everything I taught them, and, um, and that was kind of how it worked. So when I came into the CHAMP program, suddenly it was like I'm not just working with the students anymore, but I, there was such a big push of working with everybody that they – that works with them, the teachers and um, the one-to-ones and the family as well. So it totally changed my thinking. I had never written a t teaching plan before, and then I realized how much, um, I hate to say, easier it made my job. But once I made the teaching plans and I could teach everybody else how to do it, I started seeing such growth in their generalization. Um, and just growth all around. So I really encourage everybody to kind of shift more into that kind of thinking, especially as we get into transition age. Um, so ASHA is the speech and language hearing and hearing organization nationally. And they have a couple things to say. I'll just touch on this briefly, but they talk about pull out service versus push in and kind of the benefits. Uh, basically saying that like when you're pulling them out of, the, out of a classroom for speech therapy specifically, but any related service, you're pulling them away from their peers and the classroom. So there's a lot of missed opportunity there. Uh, there has been a couple studies, you'll see them listed there um, on those last two bullets. They're specifically on, on preschool and early um, elementary school aged kids, but they did find that there was better results with generalization when they pushed in. So they also talk about integrated versus in-class services. So when you're integrating into the classroom, it gives you those opportunities to teach the people working with the student rather than only teaching the student. And lastly, Ash's view on other educational settings. I like this because they list educational settings as like playground, media center, lunchroom, vocational training sites, music classrooms, et cetera. But I like that they also say, and other classrooms. So by calling it other classrooms, they're identifying that all of those are classrooms in themselves. and. And anywhere can be a classroom as long as you're providing instruction there. Does anybody have any questions about those things? Okay. So what are the benefits of delivering related services within the community? Just to, Asha kind of touched on all of these, but it eliminates any missed classroom time because I'm pushing into what they're already doing. It allows the service provider to demonstrate how they're implementing the accommodations from the SDI section and also like how they're implementing teaching plans to take data on goals and training the staff of how to best support the student. Uh, lastly, it provides opportunities for the therapist to support um, in that least restrictive environment, which is so important. So uh, you might not be getting as, oh, we'll talk about that next. So the challenges include the community can certainly be unpredictable, which is always a challenge whenever you're in a speech room or an occupation, uh, occupational therapy room. You have all your materials right there. It's a very structured environment and you can kind of uh, manipulate that to make sure that you're getting the results that are targeted. But when you're out in the community, you don't have that same control. So there is, it's, it's challenged me for sure to learn how to kind of think on the fly and, and I've had to learn to become very flexible. Uh, with that, I'm not getting as many trials and opportunities. I can't do that drill kind of therapy that I used to do before. So I'm not getting the quantity of, of trials in, but I think that the trials that I am getting are, are a lot, have a lot more quality to them because they're occurring with different partners and in the setting that hopefully when that opportunity occurs again and I'm not there, they can still perform that same skill. Um, it's definitely more difficult to collect data. Kim talked about this a little bit earlier. So we're writing teaching plans and trying to make sure that they're very clear and concise. And we're making them as simple as we can and portable so that our mentors are carrying around these little black books with the students so they can like quick do a plus or minus down the data sheet to track whether or track the data. So we're trying to make it easy for them because if it's difficult, it's not going to be done or it's not going to be done correctly. 
um, managing behaviors in the community is certainly a challenge all the time. And, and Kim also touched on this. We're taking baby steps. We're doing high reward and low demand as much as we can and then expanding those opportunities as, the, as they are successful. Um, we've had students that come to us that their first dip into the community is going out in a van to look at their future uh, vocational site and that's it and they, they're highly rewarded when they come back just for going out in the van and then it might be two years later but by the time they get there or after two years they're working for 90 minutes in that location so it, it might take a long time but we can certainly get there uh, training staff and peers can definitely be a challenge I get a lot of pushback sometimes um, I see some nodding so <laughs> you probably get that as well when I I was when I was at a previous school I remember being like somebody had a greeting goal and I was like how am I supposed to get data on this I'm one person so I get one greeting every time they come to the speech room like how am I going to take data on this and they were like oh have their para take data and I remember like talking to them about it and they were like what are you talking about like how am I going to take data on this and I remember being so lost in that situation and, and coming to the chant program I realized like all it takes is creating a small little data sheet teaching the mentor or the or the para how to fill out that data and and as long as you're clear and concise they're usually pretty on board with doing it and we use a lot of reinforcement with them as well like they want to do their job well and they want to see the student succeed as well so um just making things clear and and giving some guidance is sometimes all it takes lastly aac in the community that's a big speech one i get all the time that can be certainly very difficult um my advice for that is that if a student is using AAC, it's supposed to go everywhere with them. So it should be going with them anyway. And then how you're writing the teaching plan should include with it how the people in the community should be using it with them. So it should all be integrated. It's definitely not easy, but if the people working with the student don't know how to use the AAC, then how are they going to teach the person to use the AAC? So it it's all comes with training of the staff. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier, but further research is needed for transition age students. Um, the research that I was finding was really based off of much younger populations. So how to target goals and collect data for community-based instruction. You want to write goals that are measurable. We already know this, but I think it's even more important when you're in a community base. Like you can't have this very extravagant goal with multiple parts and it's not easily measurable because when you're on the fly and you're trying to manage behaviors, it's going to fall to the end of the list if it's not easy to follow. Um, I always use a prompting hierarchy. We start with er errorless lead, errorless learning, like using a most to least prompting hierarchy. I always start in a structured setting, so I'll start at the classroom. So I don't have a speech room, I don't have a desk, I have a computer and a book bag that I brought today, so I brought my desk. Um, and then I set up wherever the student is. So if, if, if I'm in the classroom, I set up at their desk and maybe I'm starting in kind of, that's my structured environment. I want to make sure that all my trials occur within that one activity. Um, because if I use like a, a prompt, they're going to get the same prompt the next one, the same one. So they're getting those multiple trials in that little environment. Um, once they make it there, then we're going to move into more unstructured environments. So then maybe the next environment I'm doing that is at a job site or out in the community, even just sitting at like a park bench in the park. Uh, and then finally, when I get to the overall goal, then I'm going to kind of mix and match different environments and partners. Once, the, once I'm able to fade the prompt hierarchy all the way down, then I use an error correction procedure. Um, to correct any errors that may occur. Tons of reinforcement, and it's always so important to remember that whatever is reinforcing is gonna change day by day and maybe minute by minute. So we're always doing preference assessments. And it might be as easy as like, whatever you have available to reinforce and you're holding it out in front of them and just saying like, so what do you wanna work for? Uh, we always make sure the goals, teaching plans, and data sheets are clear, concise, and focused in order to pr promote fidelity across all the teaching partners. And as Kim mentioned before, I always make sure that we're sending our teaching plans home to the parents because um, so often, I know you guys probably have heard this too, like it's like I'm reporting on data and saying like, oh, so-and-so is answering WH questions with 90% accuracy across five consecutive data collections, so they've met the goal. And the parents say, they never do that for me at home. And it's often because things like WH questions, it's, it's this big. And so if you're asking them, what did you do last year for vacation? That's a lot harder than where did you work today? 
So that's all going to be defined in the teaching plan. So that way we're, we're all looking, at, we're comparing apples to apples. We're not comparing apples to oranges. We're all doing the same thing. Um, so this is a student example. So we have a wide variety of students, as all programs do. And, and we have students that are nonverbal and use AAC or picture exchange. And we're working on manding skills with them. We also have students who are completely verbal and we're working on conversational skills. So I tried to choose something like right in the middle. So this student will say already has the ability to request label and answer familiar w WH questions such as where did you work today? So if we're working on developing that kind of conversation skills and getting them to comment or describe actions of others, um, we'll start with answering what doing questions. It's kind of a more complicated WH question. So like I mentioned earlier, the overall goal, I want them to be able to answer that question across environments and across partners. But the way I'll teach it is the first objective, we might start with one partner in one structured environment. The second one, we might move into a second environment, but still all those opportunities are incurring in a, I call a structured environment when all the trials occur in one activity. And then into the unstructured, so you're doing it across the day and making sure that it's generalizing. So these are some examples, that student in particular answering what doing questions, the way I started to teach this is I would take pictures of him and his peers doing actions across the day. And then at the end of the day, we would sit down and kind of have a retell of his day and we would use the pictures as support. So what are you doing? What is he doing? And then use a communication board to help develop like use of pronouns and to be verbs. But the target was to get things like, I am wiping tables, he is sorting hangers. And the overall functional piece of this was that I wanted him to be able to go home and tell his parents about his day. So often the parents were asking them, how was your day? What did you do today? And they ended up listing their schedule. So it would be like lunch, work, ride bus home, or whatever it might be. So kind of developing within, within those answers. So this is an example of a teaching plan and data sheet. I try to sometimes squish it all onto one at a glance because sometimes I, I feel like they won't look at the, another page if I have two. So in this one, oh, I'm just walking away. Um, in this one specifically, you'll see the goals at the top, then the objective that we're working on, and then a short teaching plan underneath of it that's like a step by step. Like first do this, this is how you're going to set up the environment, then do this, and it kind of walks them explicitly through. Um, on the bottom, you'll see it kind of divides the target into different parts, and that allows me to, to an, analyze the data so I can see where the errors are occurring. But one of the most important things here is the initials box at the bottom, and I found that to be really important because that um, has some accountability. So whoever's working with them that day and is responsible for taking that data, that way they know like if it wasn't collected one day, I can go back and see who they worked with that day and know why that data wasn't collected. I can also see if for some reason they're always doing, getting it correct with one person and, and not getting it correct with another person. That can, uh, can give me, um, let me know that I need to observe how they're doing it and, and where the error is. is. Is someone not doing it correctly and someone is doing it correctly or is someone over prompting? And I can kind of figure that out a little bit more. Um, I always teach the data sheets by modeling the teaching plan for the staff, then watching them implement it. And a lot of times I write them and I think it comes off a certain way and then I get feedback from them that it's read a totally different way and that's okay. So then I, I take their feedback and I revise it however it's needed. Uh, it's always, they're always organic, they're always changing and so I never save anything as a PDF because I'm always going to go in and change it. Um, and then I provide teaching and support for staff or how to create opportunities across the day. This is huge. So I often get feedback from people working where they're like, well, the opportunity just didn't occur. It just didn't come up. And it's always like, well, that's them. I think we're not doing our job because we can, we can, there's always opportunity and we just have to make sure that we're looking through a lens to see those opportunities and making sure that we're not jumping the gun and kind of, um, either answering for them or, or getting in front of them so that that opportunity isn't utilized. And last, monitor data, of course. Um, once we analyze the data, we want to see where the errors are, um, decide if we need to increase or decrease prompt levels, add communication partners or environments, and 
um, or shift into new unstructured environments. Um, so again, we have a wide range of students. Um, so we'll have all, these are just some ideas of different targets that we've used. They're definitely not all of them, but if you're looking for ideas, there are some up there. Um, another one for some of our higher level kids is something I'd like to get into more this year is using social media as kind of more of a friend file. So I've done friend files with a lot of students and it's funny how, um, now there's Facebook and, and Instagram and things like that. And, they're, and like they're friend files that you don't have to manage. It's awesome. So just getting into the habit with kids like, okay, we know we're going to work with this person. Let's look up their social media page and see what they're up to. And we can ask them about, uh, oh, I saw you went on vacation to the beach. How was that? Um, there's also a lot of problem solving, which I see with some of my with some of my other students, um, where you get friend requests and not being able to tell the difference between who's a true friend and who's an acquaintance. And so when you get those random friend requests on Instagram, you can be like, well, do you actually know this person? Like, have you met them? Do you have mutual friends? Do you have mutual interest? Why did they friend you? Or are they just friending you because they want followers? So um, kind of using that as a, a guide to defining what friendships are. Um, so some pictures of us around school following a recipe. There's our friend Zoe again using a picture, a picture recipe. And we often do higher level WH questions in there. So how many or how much. Um, there's Frankie with the syrup. We do breakfast clubs, which are really fun. Um, so it's, it's community, but we're doing it in the school. It allows for great social opportunities with them, allowing them to request from each other instead of requesting from me. So if Frankie has the syrup, I want to make sure somebody's asking him for the syrup. If they ask me, I'm like, I don't have it. So tons of opportunity there. Um, we went, this is a field trip. We were watching a guy play an instrument and, and supporting them and asking questions and making comments about what we were watching. Um, and that last one there is uh, kickball. We love to go out and play kickball, and there's so many great opportunities there. Again, it's a lot of times we don't have access to the community, but even just going out and playing a kickball game, you're kind of out in the community, and you can use that for turn taking and gaining attention is awesome. Um, we have the kids line up when to get ready for their turn to kick the ball, and they have to get the attention of the person who's pitching. So we have one of the staff pitching, and we have to make sure that they're yelling out to them like, "Hey, Katie, I'm ready." Um, or letting the person behind them know it's their turn. Buying groceries, tons of opportunities there. Kim mentioned ordering at the deli. That's one of my favorites. We had a huge grumpy guy that worked behind the deli. And he, I was so scared of him the first time that I had a student with AAC ordering from him because he was like, next. And um, after, but again, training the community. After a couple times, he and I explained to him what we were doing with the kids, and now he's the best. He always makes sure that he waits on our kids. He's so patient. Um, so that exposure is so great, not only for our kids, but also for the community. And lastly, ordering lunch. We do that every Friday. We try to get for a lunch outing. That's another one that if you don't have access to the community, you can always contrive those opportunities within the school. Um, we use picture menus that they we help them fill out before we go, and we role play and have them practice ordering, and then they go and, and do the orders. Um, do you have any questions for me about related services? You guys are a quiet group. Home stretch, we promise. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So we have a little activity planned, but before we do that, I just want to just wrap up by touching on some points. I think so often we overthink instruction in general, but in particular when it comes to CBI, you start where you are. You know, we don't necessarily get students that come into our program that have a lot of background in community-based instruction. We don't get kids who are community ready, as some people say. That's our job. So you start small. You start where you are. As Aaron said, it might be as simple as previewing a destination, driving by, your walking community. I think we overthink things and, and think that it has to be so grandiose when it could be as simple as a, kick game, a kickball game at your local park. So many opportunities for instruction out in the community can be on such a small scale. We just have to be aware of it. You know, taking those ecological assessments, establishing what skills we want to target across different environments, and then utilizing instruction within the classroom to help support generalization out in the community, as Erin said. So, are we got, are you, oh, I'm sorry, question? Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question is, have we used surveys to determine interest from parents and students? Yes, all the time. Surveys are our friend. So oftentimes when we get a new student into the program, part of the paperwork that goes home with them is like a little interest inventory that we have the parents fill out collaboratively with the student so that we can gain some more information on not only their experiences, but their interests. Because, you know, we have this beautiful IEP document. It doesn't always come to us in beautiful shape, but... Um, that doesn't always tell us everything we need to know about the student. So to your point, working collaboratively with the parents, having an ongoing open discussion about student interests and, and their skill sets and things like that. Some of the assessment tools that we mentioned in here, the Brigants, there's a great rating skill that we have in there that the students can fill out themselves or that we can provide assistance with. So that helps us too to get that information about what interests you. Sometimes the students don't even know. So those are great tools to use. Great question. Any other questions? Are we up for a quick little activity? Just five minutes, I promise. <laughs> yeah, all right. You guys are troopers. So we have a little bit of practical application here based on what we talked about. So we're going to have you guys pick a traditional school goal from the following slide. You can chat with your neighbor, the person next to you, or anybody in your row, or just on your own. And we want to know, how would you revise the goal to target the same skill, but within a community setting. Make it functional, measurable, clear, and concise, and be creative. So here are some traditional goals in the areas of math, reading, behavior, and speech and language. So literally take two minutes, chat with the person next to you, find a buddy, and then we want to hear from you. All right? And go. All right, so who wants to help us out here? Tell us which goal you picked. You don't have to read it. And tell us how you would revise it to reflect CBI. Yes? Oh. You know what? Hold on. I'm coming to you. <laughs> you can, but just in case. I don't want the IT people to yell at me. When given a boxed cake mix, at the grocery store, the student will correctly answer comprehension questions about the directions on the cake mix. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, come on, just one more, two more. Yeah, go ahead. Here I come. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got little legs. <laughs> um, I said, uh, when out in the community, the student will um, correctly identify five items on a menu that he can afford within a, a lot of amount of money, no, no more than $10 or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I like that one. Anyone else want to share? Anyone have any thoughts, questions? Any experiences you want to share? Oh, I'm trapped now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, so these were similar to goals that we inherited, and, and sometimes we have the opportunity to revise them, and sometimes we have to wait until the next IEP and, and, and come up with a kind of where we're going to shape them for the next IEP year. So this is, these are some examples of how we might shape them. It's definitely, obviously, you guys know, there's not one right answer to that, and it's going to depend on the student, but just to get some ideas. Um, I think we're getting right to the end, so if anybody has any specific questions, we can hang out for a couple minutes, but thank you guys for um, participating and listening so actively at the end of the day. We know it's been a long one. You guys really were troopers, so as Erin said, feel free to come up and chat with us. We can give you our cards and our contact information, or if you have specific questions. If not, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thank you so much. <laughs>